So we're recording. Um, also, again, if you guys can, please turn on your cameras. Um, so last week, right, or last Thursday, not your guys' class, but Thursday's class, what I noticed, the only people who were engaging in class conversation were the people with their cameras on. So that could be just a coincidence or there could be a method to that. I would lean towards um, the latter, right? So again, I'm not taking participation points, but I do know who participates based on conversation. And the more you participate, the better off you'll do in the class because I can tell that you're grappling with the information. Um, so let's jump, in, let's jump into Ngugi Wa Thiango's book, uh, Decolonizing the Mind. Um, it's the politics of language in African literature. So again, as we deal with this conversation around the oral tradition and this notion of a voice, this voice begins to morph into a written form. And Ngugi is struggling with this notion of how do I center and authenticate my voice through another language, particularly through a colonial language. So a lot of the conversation that we had while we were engaging um, Maladoma Patrice Somme last week will be picked up in this week's conversation. So one, just like you know, Somme, what, what is the thesis? What is the project that Ngugi is seeking to pick up in the pages of this text? What is he trying to get the readers to think about, right? So that's something I'm always concerned about. Um, and then particularly as it pertains to this notion of language and it pertains to this idea of the destiny for Africa, right? So he, he articulates on the first page something around the destiny of Africa being tied to this idea of language, right? So that's something that I'm curious, with, curious about. <laughs> Another thing I'm curious about is the problems of Africa. He, he mentions how the problems of Africa are not caused by tribalism, but by colonialism, but by imperialism, right? So that's another point of emphasis that I gleaned from the reading that I think we should touch on it through conversation. Um, then this notion that any victory against imperialism, any victory against colonialism is a victory for all imperialists, all anti-colonialists, right? So what does that mean? Um, and then this notion of the language of the oppressed, right? Being able to build relations, being able to build community, being able to build coalitions around language of oppressed people. So what does Ngugi mean by that, right? How does he, how does he visualize that materialize? Um, he mentions also the cultural bomb of imperialism. And I'm curious to know how does that affect, affect with an A, not effect with an E, how does that affect African language? Um, this notion of African language and ontology, again, so how you come to know yourself, right? But looking at how you come to know yourself from the auspice of language. Um, also, this notion of self-definition, right? So on page four, he talks about language as being a tool for self-definition. So what does that mean in the colonial context? What does that mean for people who, have, who are bilingual, who have multiple languages? Do they have multiple identities? Do they have multiple uh, ways of self-defining? Um, so he also deals with contradictions, right? Um, the contradiction of being pro-African or being a pro-African intellectual or pro-African thinker, but using European languages to articulate thoughts, right? So he views that as somewhat of a contradiction. Um, and then that kind of centers around the conference of African writers um, writing on, um, what is it, using English expression, right? So this is kind of the contradictions that Ngugi is, is dealing with. Um, and then this notion of the paradox between your mother, your mother tongue and the uh, fatalistic logic. So that something is up with that. And, and what is Ngugi trying to get us to think about in this idea of your native, native tongue and this fatalistic logic? Um, and then is this question of, can we use Western languages, French, English, to articulate African ideas, right? And then think about the problems Patrice Somme was having writing his autobiography, right? 
So think about what he said kind of kept him from being able to produce his autobiography. And then the question that Ngugi is asking is, you know, can we use English to really articulate truly African ideas, right? So, so think about that. And then he goes into this idea of the production of a new English, right? A new English that can produce African ideas, like the, what he called like a, a Western African English, right? So English from people, English speaking Nigerians, right? English speaking Ghanaians. Is this a new form of English, right? So this is a, a question that um, Ngugi is posing. And then this question of how did African writers become so feeble in dealing with their own languages, right? So what, what does he mean by that? What does that mean? And what does that even mean for those writers in this classroom who are bilingual? How do you relate to your, what you call your mother tongue, right? Um, this notion of physical and spiritual subjugation, right? And he says that the physical subjugation comes from the canon and then the spiritual subjugation comes from language. So think about what that means and then think about how I mentioned the three vestiges of enslavement are language, religion, and um, your names, right? So how does those two ideas co coexist? So those are, are my points of emphasis from the nine pages that we read from Ngugi. A um, little bit about Ngugi himself. He's a, a, a Kenyan writer. Um, he writes predominantly in, in Kukuyu and um, Bantu, which are Kenyan languages, right? So he writes specifically in his native tongue. Um, in this book here, in the uh, preface, he says this is the last book that he will write in English, right? So think about what you read in the intro based off the premise that this is in Google's last book in English, okay? So again, he writes particular, or predominantly in Kikuyu and Bantu, which are um, Kenyan languages. He got his BA from Makari University in Uganda, and he got his graduate degree from Leeds University in English, in England. So he's educated on the continent of Africa as well as Europe, right? So again, this play between his native tongue and European languages. So even his education is reflective of that oscillation. Um, he won a child. He won a, a prize for the book, the novel entitled "Weep Not Child." And what that novel is about is a family that was pulled into the Mau Mau Revolution of Kenya. Now, this is very important because this gives you a sense of who Ngugi is and why he's writing about what he's writing about. So just like in all of Africa, Kenya was um, colonized in the Kenyans case by the British and um, they had a revolution right, the, the Mau Mau Revolution, M-A-U, M-A-U, and they were able to overthrow British colonialism, right? Um, Yomo Kenyatta was one of the um, figureheads that came out of this revolution who, were, who, would come, who would become the president of Kenya, right? So think about this. He's observing a country who was able to overthrow colonialism, gain its independence, and then situate one of the leaders of that revolutionary struggle in the role of president, okay? So this is informing the way that he's looking at the world. This is informing the way that he views African um, agency, right? So he can't really view African people as completely subjugated because he knows he came from a people who were able, who were able to overcome oppression and, and fight for their liberation, right? So this informs the way that he thinks about his writing. This informs the way that he goes about producing his novel, right? Um, this is as, le as recent as 2019. He's a professor at UC Irvine. Um, he's in the School of Arts and Humanities, and he engages in cr critical literature. So um, you do have access to, to him, right? So that's one thing as scholars, you know, you always want to, one, if you find someone whose interests, his research interests you, look them up, see where they're located, shoot them an email. Um, one thing about academia, people are, are pretty willing to talk about their research, right? And that allows you to do good research yourself because you don't have to think about what Ngubi's saying, right? You can actually reach out to him and get an idea of what he meant by certain things. So some things that may be opaque to you, you could actually reach out to him to get clarity, right? So this is something to kind of be attentive to as a scholar. Um, it's not like the celebrity in the sense to where they don't want to talk about their work or they think they're too good to communicate. They're more than willing to talk about what they, what they write, what they find of interest, and also help you along the path of research. 
So I definitely, um, you know, as you continue your academic career, something sparks your, sparks your interest or a particular writer kind of stands out to you, I, I would encourage you to reach out to them. Okay, so those are my points of emphasis as it pertains to Ngugi. Um, from here, we'll jump into our fishbowl, but before we do that, is there any questions that you guys have about anything I've mentioned, anything that was covered, or anything about the reading in general? No, okay. Um, so for our fish bowlers, um, Emily, how do you feel about fish bowling? Emily, can you hear me? How do you feel about fish bowling? Oh, you already went. Okay, I'm sorry. Correct me. So if you already went, don't worry about it. Um, Esperanza, have you fish bowled already? Uh, no. Are you okay um, to fish? But I think I'm gonna have. I think I'm gonna have to skip this time. Okay, no worries. So just know if you get called on again, though, you have to. Um, you have to go. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Ingrid, have you fish bowled already? No, but can I pass? Yep, sure can. Um, Lizette, have you fish bowled? No, but I'll go. Okay. Thank you, Lizette. Um, Cecilia, have you fish bowled? I fish both like the very first time. <laughs> you good. Um, Nico, Nikoko, have you uh, fish bowl? Miyoko, have you fish bowl already? Your mic is up. All right. Um, Sandy, have you fishbowl? No. Are you prepared to fishbowl? Yes. Um, Alyssa, have you fishbowl already? No. I'm sorry, you said you did? No, I said no. Okay. Are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, is there anybody who wants to fishbowl? All right, so we have um, Alyssa, Sandy, Lizette, and then Emily. So um, at this point, I'm gonna open up the conversation to you guys. Um, once those four individuals said their piece, we'll open up the conversation to the overall class, and then we'll go from there. I'll start it. So one, like something that stood out to me was what you discussed about how us being bilingual and how it's like a part of our like identity and the way he states that the choice of language and the use to which language is put is central to people's definition of themselves. I like how he put- Not, not oh. to cut you off, but if you can do me a favor, just um, let us know what page you're on. So that oh, way- sorry. Like, it's page it's page four. I really like how he put that because like being bilingual, like knowing a different language is part of my identity, knowing that I can make conversation with someone who knows Spa who knows Spanish and like knowing like being more knowledgeable of how the language came to be. And he like presents the self like trying to be like he's trying to be go more in depth with like the African literature and like trying to connect it with like the readers, trying to say like okay maybe you may not know this but maybe you could like refer like you could connect it to yourself uh, i agree with you sandy um i wrote down a similar thing um on page eight paragraph two i think um he said in order to capture the vivid images of african speech i had to eschew the habit of expressing my thoughts first in english and I feel, I, I really agree with that part because like English, like when you're thinking of it in 
your mother tongue that is in English, like I feel like translating it kind of waters it down in a way. And like you really, you think about things differently when you are bilingual or multilingual. Like for me, like if I think in Spanish, like I feel like I think really differently than when I think in English. And it, it just really affects like, um, like your ideas and your way of thinking and expressing yourself. Um, I guess I went in. Um, I found this reading a little more like difficult than the others, or than the last one at least. Um, it's like back on the same level as like the first reading, I feel. But um, throughout the whole reading, I felt like it was interesting to me how how they identify with their language, like that their language is essentially like their entire culture like you know it's it's like their their language and like for me I don't know I just speak English so I've never like I don't in identify with English or I'm just that's just what I speak but it's not like that's not something that is like dear to me like to them or something like they cherish their their language like and I don't know, I just find that really interesting because I've never, like, I just speak the language. Like, I don't think about um, the history or, like, you know. So, if, if I could kind of respond to um, Alyssa's point, because... <clears throat> You know, it's very interesting, your assessment of that. And I, I'm going to kind of give like a brief story on how I found out about this book. Um, I was in a seminar on James Baldwin. And Baldwin is talking about, which English speaker right here, they have, he's not bilingual by any stretch of the imagination, but he talks about finding your native tongue as a writer. And I thought to myself, like, what the fuck you mean native tongue, bro? We all, we only speak English, you know? Um, but he he was cognizant of the fact of how we came into speaking English from a historical context, right? So if we are to link our experience to descendants of African people, which we are, right? Um, this is not our native tongue, right? We were introduced to the, this tongue through enslavement. Um, it would be no difference really for my bilingual individuals in the course who speak Spanish, right? Realistically, you're bilingual between two colonial languages, right? English is a colonial language, just as Spanish is a colonial language. The, um, the Spanish conquistadors brought that language to this continent. And the people who now pick it up were speaking a different language prior to. So um, as we're having this conversation in seminar, there was an African sister, I believe she's from Nigeria, who mentioned in Gooby's book, and this idea of struggling with language and language kind of informing your identity. So what Alyssa is alluding to in the sense that the pride that they have in this language is, is absolutely true, right? And, and I think most people who have a native language, there's a pride to a certain regard in that language, especially for people who, and again, think about who Ngugi is in the political sphere, right? He watched his people go through armed revolutionary struggle. So that's going to also inform the pride that he has in his native culture and his native language, right? Um, but then I, I also started thinking upon reading this. Um, so I was born in 83, right? So the 90s, I was about, I was, you know, a teenager. So in the mid 90s, there was a very large conversation happening in Oakland around Ebonics. And for those who don't know, Ebonics is like what you may call slang or what you would call black vernacular conversation, right? And what they were doing in Oakland was they were trying to normalize the use of Ebonics in educational spaces. So what that would look like and how that would play out is I could say I am bilingual because I could switch between your standard English and your Ebonics, right? And in the classroom, just as I, as I do as a professor, right, I don't use the standard, I don't come up here and talk like I'm, I don't do that shit, right? I just talk to you like I talk on the street. So um, 
they in Oakland they use that say well man we're going to elevate this secondary language and make it an official language and let's see what the production of that is how many of you guys are familiar with Aaron um Ryan Coogler excuse me how many of you figure familiar with Ryan Coogler movie producer um he, he directed the Black Panther film um how many of you are for you who are football fans, um, you may remember like um, Evonix mostly known as. Um, Alyssa, can you speak on that? Isn't Evonix mostly known as Ave? Is it, is it like pronounced A, but it's an acronym for African American Vernacular yeah. English? Yes, yeah, that, it's, yeah it's the like, same thing. Yeah, because like slang nowadays with everybody going like, you know, like the terms, it's the blank for me or child anyways. Right. That's like the Ebonics is like, you know, mostly now. Or... Right. And we, uh, implicitly in what Elissa is saying is how this Ebonics or this slang has become mainstream, right? So now, now everyone uses it to where as in the past, there was a certain space where you could use that now typically only on the street, right? Um, but now it's, it's in corporate America, it's in your offices, it's, it's in your boardroom, it's everywhere. Um, but going back to Oakland and, and these individuals like Ryan Coogler, um, Marshawn Lynch, if you ever heard Marshawn Lynch give an interview, they talk like they from Oakland. If you ever been to Oakland, there's a certain diction in a certain way that they speak that's it's, it's unprecedented. You know that motherfucker from Oakland just by the way that they talk, right? So. To me, I find it interesting that no matter where these individuals are and what platform that they're on, they always speak their truth. And they always speak that Ebonics, if you want to call it that, right? They always speak that Oakland slang, that town talk, right? So I don't think that's a coincidence. And I liken that to what they were doing in Oakland in the mid 90s, right? So I'm around the age of Ryan Coogler and I'm around the age of Marshawn Lynch. So to me, it makes sense that they still speak the way that they do because they came from an environment where that was supported, right? So when you talk about keeping your native language, even for black folks here in America, this is how that plays out, right? Um, but at this point, let's open it up to, the, to a larger group conversation. What did everybody else think about the readings? Um, actually, I'm sorry. I wanted to add on to what you were saying. Um, would that be kind of like the way um, colonizers came to um, America and and they um, they took their English and they turned it into our English? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what happened, yeah. Yep. And that's why I say English and Spanish is a colonial language, right? Like, we're not escaping that. Um, someone, uh, I have a question. Oh, go, go for it, go for it. Um, 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 you said earlier that uh, Nagugi is this is going to be his last book in English, mm -hmm. and you were saying that like ah, uh, it's slipping me that um, the language you choose to write in defines you as a character. So by dropping language, does that mean he's dropping like colonialism, yeah. imperialism? So like that's a great. That's a great question, Arion, and that's a question on method, right? So let me just rephrase the question to make sure everybody's fully understanding what you're saying because it's profound. So he's saying is, based on Ngugi, it's not, not my saying, but Ngugi says, you know, how you write is the essence of who you are in a sense, right? So Arion's question is, so by him choosing to no longer write in English, i.e. the colonial language, what does that say for his relation with colonialism, right? He's taking a stance of disavowal against colonialism. So I'm, I'm working against that. Think about what the, the book is called, right? Decolonizing the mind, right? So if you're going to decolonize, I don't know which one of you said it, but um, I think it may have been Sandy who was saying how if you're bilingual, right, your thought process go in the language of what you're trying to think in. It, it, they're tied, right? So and part of that decolonizing process is to decolonize your language, right? So you're absolutely spot on. And, and so that speaks to Arian, not only his thesis, right? So my first point of, of, of emphasis was like, what is this project? What is he trying to get us to think about, right? You hit it on the head. One, 
how does language interact with colonialism? And then how does language interact with your identity in the way that you see yourself, right? And being attentive to that, you can be decolonial in the way that you choose to speak or the way that you choose to write or the way that you choose to produce whatever type of art that you choose to produce. It's a very good point. Um, looking at the chat, um, Esperanza asked, you know, like, so would accents be considered another language? That may be more, if anything, another dialect, like another way of speaking, right? Um, I think if we're taking the Ebonics example, I think that was a, a, a succinct move that was made by people within the Black community to say that we're going to position this as another language, right? So I, I think that's where the separation comes from just having an accent. Because realistically speaking, it's not, that vernacular is not a, an accent because it has its own terminology, right? It, it, it has its own meaning of things. Um, again, if you go back to the Oakland, if you say that shit slap, it don't mean you get slapped in the face, right? It means it was good, the music was loud, it means it tastes well, whatever, right? So that's a, a totally different translation of a word. So it's not really an accent. Now, Oakland people have an accent, but the terminology is still different. If that kind of answers your question, Esperanza. But, but that's a good question. Um, other thoughts about the readings? To add on to what we were just talking about, uh, or what Arion also said, I guess, and like in a way it connects. Um, I think it. I think it's really mind blowing thinking about how he he really said that he wasn't gonna write another book in English, and I, I agree with that. I think that's very like very smart. I guess you can say because it's also like um, we were oppressed into this new language to learn these new things in this new country already being oppressed by like the system or whatever so that doing this he's he's no longer being oppressed by the oppressor he's oppressing the oppressor by speaking in a language he does not they do not understand yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's like a, it's giving a finger to eurocentric thinking right it's giving a finger a finger to western culture it's like you guys are going to force this down my throat Fuck that. No, nah, I ain't going to do that. I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to speak my native language. I'm going to speak and think the way that I want to think. Um, I, I liken that kind of to what we read last week, how Maladon Patrice Omey said, you know, I'm going to still wear my African garb wherever I'm at, right? Um, even though I'm educated, I'm supposed to be wearing three-piece Italian suits. I like my boba. You know, I like my dashiki. This, is, this is, speaks to who I am. Um, what do you guys think about this idea? And, and we kind of touched on it a little bit in our conversation of Ebonics, but what do you think about his idea around a new language or a new English? I found that interesting. So I think yeah, it's on page eight. So on page eight, top of the page, uh, first paragraph, as a writer who believes in the utilization of African ideas, African philosophy and African folklore and, and imagery to the fullest extent possible, I am of the opinion the only way to use them effectively is to translate them almost literally from the African language native to the writer to into whatever European language he is using as a medium of expression. I have, in, I have endeavored in my words to keep as close as possible to the vernacular expression. For, from a word, a group of words, a sentence, and even a name in any African language, one can glean the social norms, attitudes, and values of the people. Okay, so one, he's saying like, I, I like to kind of keep the African essence of, of what I'm dealing with, right? But, you know, I, I realize that my audience may not be speaking that language, so I, I recognize I need to translate that to a, a Western language, right? So that's at the top of the page. And he goes to the very bottom of page eight um, after, you know, and this is the words of Chinawana Echibe, a, a very famous um, African writer that's around, was one of uh, Ngugi's contemporaries. He's a little bit older than Ngugi because um, Ngugi looks up to him. But, but they find themselves down the road positioned as contemporaries. So in Gubi, I'm sorry, in Chibe states, I feel that the English language will be able to carry the weight of my African experience. 
but it will have to be a new English, still in full communion with its ancestral home, but altered to suit new African surroundings. So I found that interesting because one, at the top of it, right, we have Ngugi saying, you know, we got to translate this in a way that even a broader audience could um, have access to it, but we need to keep that African essence of what it is, right? And he picks up from Achibe, who feels that the English, lang English language can carry the weight of the African customs and culture, right? And is able to keep its essence in intact still. So these are two frames of thought, right? And Gugi supported by Achibe, who would posit or who argues that English or Western languages are sufficient for carrying African ideas and African philosophy. Right, so this is what we're dealing with in this book. Now, let's go back last week and think about um, Somme, excuse me. And he has an issue with producing his text. What was his issue? If you guys remember what we were talking about last week, what kept Somme from go ahead? Wasn't it like he couldn't really figure out how to write his experiences down in English? Exactly. So, translating from African to English was a problem for so many because he felt there were certain things that did not take place in English that English didn't have words for, right? There are certain experiences that you could not put into English language. Think about what we were saying earlier, how your language and your translation also reflects your thinking. So when you're thinking in Spanish and you're about to speak in Spanish, sorry, when you're speaking in Spanish, you're thinking in Spanish. When you're speaking in English, you're thinking in English, right? So to me, I don't know how I feel about the claim that Ngugi is making and the claim that um, Achibe is making as far as English being that, that um, conduit to carry African philosophies, ideas, and tradition. That's my thoughts. But what are you guys, how do you guys feel about that? Especially you bilingual individuals because you play that out on a quotidian daily basis. Um, I'll say something. So I also agree with you. I feel, I don't feel like in the translation process, like speaking Spanish, for example, when I'm talking to my mom and let's say I'm trying to tell her something that I learned at school, or I think that is really cool. When I try to tell it to her in Spanish, I like lose myself and I feel like it doesn't give like, it doesn't convey properly and the other way around. Let's say I'm having a conversation with my mom and then the next day I want to tell someone who doesn't really speak Spanish either. The, trans, the whole translation process, I feel like it loses some type of meaning. So for him to like value his, um, the philosophy so like strongly and him saying that like, um, how is it that the English, the English language can um, portray that, it, it confuses me because I feel like it loses its power. That's a very good point. Um... But so this, this notion of argumentation, right? So again, when we think about method, um, it, it all ties into this style of argumentation, right? So we have all of that going on on page eight. Him saying that, you know, we need to use these other languages to help support our, um, to help broaden our message, right? He, he pulls on one of his um, contemporaries and one of his mentors, Achibe, uh, who says, you know, he feels that um, um, English is sufficient to be able to carry African ideas. But then on page nine, I'm, I'm a, I'll, second paragraph, and I'll read the whole paragraph. How did we arrive at this acceptance of fatalistic logic of the unassailable position of English in our literature, in our culture, and in our politics? Question mark. What was the route from Berlin of 1884 does anybody know what happened in Berlin in 1884? Did, did, I, any, did that stand out to anybody? Anybody ask what the fuck is he talking about when you read that? I found that part like super interesting because didn't he say that um, they all sat down and like looked at the map of people and put them in colonies based on the language and yep. like they're, yeah, like how do they just like put people in, like how are they able to do that? I don't so what he's talking about is the uh, Berlin Conference. And the Berlin Conference took place in 1884. Um, 
at the Berlin conference, they literally, all the, the Western powers of Europe got together in Berlin, sat down and they carved, they laid out a map of Africa and they carved Africa up. So the British will take this area, uh, the French will take this area, the Portuguese will take this area, the Spanish will take this area. So based on who took what area, determine what language you would speak. So if, if France took over your area, so like Senegal is a French speaking colony, right? So your language would be French. So this notion of Francophone speaking Africans, um, so these are French-speaking Africans, right? So you think about people like uh, Franz Fanon. He's a French-speaking Martinique, so he's a Francophone thinker, right? Amy Césaire, which is Fanon's mentor, as a Francophone thinker as well. They, they think and they speak in French. Um, Anglophones, those are English-speaking Africans or Caribbeans, right? So, for example, in, in, um, in Googie's case, the British took over Kenya. So the Kenya has a very large English speaking population, right? So essentially when they mean the language is being distributed, they're not the native languages, right? It's the colonizer coming in and saying, well, this is our native language. So now this will become your native language. So that's how they went about um, carving up Africa. Now, mind you, when they drew these lines, sometimes the lines were drawn through ethnic cohesive communities, right? So like everyone, a lot of people are familiar with the, um, the Hutsi, Hutu and the Tutsis in Rwanda, right? Now they were one people until the British came into Rwanda and said, you are now Hutu, you are now Tutsi, right? So, and they put them at odds with each other. Um, so again, that goes back to Ngugi's point of saying how it's positioned that tribalism is the cause of all of Africans' problems. But it's not tribalism. It's imperialism, because imperialism created the tribes. Does that, does that make sense? So that's the cor correlation that we have between 1884, how languages is, is moved throughout Africa, European language is moved throughout Africa, and then how tribes are created throughout Africa as well, and this tribal division that is created throughout Africa as well, right? So when he asked the question on page nine, second paragraph, how did we arrive at this acceptance of, fate, of the fatalistic logic? What does he mean by fatalistic? What does fatal mean? Like death leaves? That's it, it's fatalistic, it's a wrap for you, right? How do we arrive at this fatalistic logic of the unsaleable position of English in our literature. So unsaleable, like we cannot go over that. This has to be, it has to be English in our language, right? In our literature, excuse me. In our culture and in our politics. What was the route for Berlin of 1884 via the Marquis of 1962? To what is still prevailing and dominant logic of 100 years later? So how is what happened in 1884 still prevalent in the Marquis of 1962. Now, this is where he got his, his, his bachelor's from, is the Marquis, right? So how is it 100 years later, we're still dealing with these same ideas, right? How did we, as African writers, come to be so feeble towards the claims of our language on us and so aggressive in our claims on other languages, particularly the language of our colonizer, colonization, right? So that's, that's the question that he really wants us to deal with. And he uses all of page eight to get us to that point on page nine. So the confusion that Cassandra felt, it makes sense because one, that's not his argument, right? And, and it almost seems contradictory to the thesis of the book. So if, you're last, if this is your last book in English, why are you going to talk about the ability of English to be translatable, right? What, what sense does that make? But he's making a counter argument, right? So he laid out his counter argument all on page eight, and then he hits you with his argument on page nine. How do we get to this point? Eileen, you had a question? I just wanted to add, because you like what Cassandra said, like with her being like, conf well, not confused, but I feel like having that doubt, like if it mm -hmm. conveyed through like Spanish, I feel like, and how did we get there to like using the language of our um, colonizers? 
it kind of reminded me on the end of page eight where he's like well will it be good enough as as english or french kind of like how they have that doubt like if he were to make that english like is that is that doubt like the reason that we still use the the language of our colonizers you know um that's a very good point Ali. and i think it, it, it plays out twofold right is one is a sense of, of, of validation right like is it really good enough if they if they don't think it's good enough right that's, that's one level and then two is this notion of like markability marketability right so like i want to sell this book so i want to make sure that it's accessible to as many people as possible um implicitly in that notion is this idea that um non-western countries aren't intellectual right so I need to write in English because only people in English are going to read this is also saying, well, people who speak Kikuyu ain't reading, right? People who speak Spanish ain't reading. People who speak Swahili ain't reading, right? So this is like the implicit meaning behind this notion of I have to write in English to have it sold and to have it validated, right? So back to Arian's point, a part of him is saying, yo, fuck all that. I'm not concerned with that. I'm gonna stay over here and, and, and deal with us. I'm gonna stay in here, I'm gonna write to the Kikuyu, right? This is, who, this is who my audience is. So this brings to like a meta question as it pertains to method. Who's your audience? And as a writer, you always have to know who are you writing to? And the, the clearer that you are in that position, the clearer your voice can become. Right? Because if you're trying to write to appease everyone, your voice is going to get muffled. It'll get, it'll get muddled out because you can't appease everyone, right? There's too many um, opposing opinions to please everybody. So one thing to think about as you're producing and as you're coming up with ideas to, to be an intellectual activity, who is, my, who is my audience, right? Who do I want to listen to this? Who am I arguing for? Who am I arguing against? And who is going to hear this argument? So that's something that always must be kept in mind. What about this notion on page nine at the bottom? Um, the subjugation of the, what do you say, the cannon? And then the, sub, sorry, the, no, the bullet. The subjugation of the bullet and then the subjugation of the language, right? So like, wh what do you think he's up to? So he says that the bullet was the physical subjugation. Right, the cannon was the physical subjugation. The gun is how they subjectified my body, right? But the language is how they subjected my spirit. What y'all think about that? And again, think about how I said, right? If we are to look at the vestiges of slavery, the lasting imprint of enslavement, language, name, religion. So this tied into what he's saying here in this last passage. So I'll read it real quick. In my view, language was the most important vehicle through which that power fascinated and held the soul prisoners. The bullet was the means of physical subjugation. Language was the means of spiritual subjugation. Let me illustrate this by drawing upon experiences in my own education, particularly in language and literature. So that's how he ends the chapter, right? So one, you know, this is what he's going to get into going forward. But the first part, part passage there is not a lot, but it's heavy, right? It's, it's, a, it's a very um, heavily loaded sentence. In my view, language was the most important vehicle through which that power fascinated and held the soul prisoner. The bullet was the means of physical subjugation. Language was the means of spiritual subjugation. So how does language, how does the colonial language hold the soul prisoner? Um, I, what, what, oh, wouldn't that, sorry. <laughs> wouldn't that tie into what Somay was talking about? How, how language, like, like in the English language, it wasn't a able to like describe the way how the African rituals would go about. And even in a ritual, it's, I forgot, I forgot. I, for, I, I forgot what he said. But in ritual, he was like, he was elaborating on, on grief and how 
in in Africa, grief is seen as a good and like you're like you should express grief as it allows the spirit to like pass pass into the afterlife. But in America, like we we hate being sad when we f- refuse to cry, we refuse to like grieve. So tying that back into what Nagugi is saying, like language is more than just like what you speak like it carries on like culture and 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 i don't know i, I don't know loss of words <laughs> but yeah because because what he was saying I, I got you cecilia um but we were saying in the ritual book right the auditory sound of the grief right to express your grief to yell to cry is part of the healing process it's necessary right so for us and, and what they would view in Africa, right, for us to come to funerals and to be all bottled up, you're holding in that grief, right? You're not allowing yourself to heal. So you're really setting yourself back from the grieving process by trying to re- remain all buttoned up. Good, very good point, Ariane. Uh, Cecilia, you are going to say something? No, I was just really agreeing with Ariane. Like, even though he got like, even, like, I know how, I understand how you get stuck sometimes, but you, have, you had a really good point. That's why I was just like, yeah, it's fine. Uh, so, Hassan, what, what do you think about this notion of language um, being a spiritual capture or being able to subjugate the spirit? And I believe you mentioned you being bilingual as well, correct, Hassan? Hassan? But just again to note, right? Like those who are engaging for the most part are those who have their cameras on. It could be just coincidence, I I don't know. Um, So another contradiction that we find within Ngugi. Um, So he's at the Conference of African Writers of Issues, sorry, Conference of African Writers of English Expression. He said that's a contradiction, right? Like. So we're all African writers, but we're writing in English, right? And the only way that you could get into this conference is by writing and submitting submitting things in English, but we're African writers, right? And um, I wanna read some passages because he has a really good question. Six, so it's it's on page six. So the top of page six, the title, A Conference of African Writers of English Expression, automatically excluded those who wrote in African languages. Now on looking back from the self-questioning heights of 1986, another point, right? So this book was published in 1986. So pay attention to what he's doing there. Now looking back from the the self-questioning heights of 1986, what do you think he means by that? Looking back from the self-questioning heights of 1986. So one, he's looking back, right? And I'm self-questioning, but it's high, right? You ever heard the term um, hindsight is 2020? Y'all never heard that? Okay. So hindsight is 2020. It seems like when I look into the past, my vision is 2020. I see everything that happens because I have the um i have the benefit of the experience right so you don't know what's happening going forward right you can't see the future but you can very clearly see the past am i correct so you can think about yesterday you can see what happened yesterday certain aspects of what happened yesterday so hindsight is 2020 right that makes sense okay so think about what he's saying here looking back from the self-questioning heights of 1986. So in 1986, I could self-question and I could do it from a high level because I'm looking back. Because hindsight is 2020, right? Like I know where we fucked up at in that conference because I have the advantage of time to let me know like, nah, y'all was tripping on that one, right? So this is what he's saying. He's saying that one, he's giving himself credit, right? He's being gracious with himself and saying that in that moment of time of the conference, I think it was in the in 1970 something. At that moment, 
I wasn't fully aware of the defaults or of the um, pitfalls of what we were signing up for, right? This whole notion of African writers having to write in English is problematic. I didn't see that then. I was just happy to be at the conference, right? But now that I'm older, now that I have these experiences, and now that I realize the importance of my native tongue, I see that in, at that conference, we was tripping, right? So the self-reflected heights of 1986, that's all that he means, right? But I brought this to your attention to let you know, one, be gracious with yourself, right? Give yourself room for error when you're looking at the past, when you're reflecting on your past, right? But also be attentive to the fact that when you're looking at the past, you're looking at it from a vantage point that you already know what was gonna happen, right? So you cannot really critique those in the past based off of your assessment of what the present moment is, right? So for example, it would be foolish of me to say that the civil rights era fucked up by trying to assimilate in 2020 because I knew how assimilation didn't prove well for us, right? But they didn't have that insight in the 1960s, so they felt that that was the thing to do, right? So that's something as intellectuals to be attentive to as well, is when you're looking back in the past, you cannot say what they should have done because they don't have the information that you have in this moment, right? Something to think about as thinkers. So to continue on, right? Looking back at the, from the self-questioning heights of 1986, I can see this contained absurd anomalies. So this is saying, I, I can see now that this is wrong. As a student, I qualify for the meeting on the basis of only two published short stories, Fig Tree and Mugumo in the student journal. Um, but neither Shaban Robert, then the greatest living East African poet with several works of poetry and prozes to his credit in Kiswahili, nor Chief Faguna, the great Nigerian writer with several published titles in your book could possibly qualify. So he's saying, right, here I am a student. So y'all in, in bachelor's, y'all bachelor students, right? You would get invited to the conference on some measly essays that you wrote that got published, right? While me, a professor, I can't go to the conference even though I'm well published, I'm recognized as the greatest poet in Africa, but I don't write in English, so I can't go, right? So he's saying this is the contradiction. So even though I'm not as qualified as some of these people who cannot go to this conference, I can go to this conference just because I write in English, right? So think about, think, take that and move it forward to page, um, was it page nine, where he asks, how did we as writers get so feeble in dealing with our own language, right? Those are some of the materializations of that feeble-minded mentality, right? Because there's institutions in place, conferences that will support you being a writer of English, but there's no institutions in place that will support you being a writer of your own native tongue, right? So this leads to this feeble-minded notions of the um, placing less value in your own mother tongue, but playing, placing greater value in English, in the English language, right? So again, you have to be attentive to the moves in the writing style, right? Because if you're not attentive, you can think what he's arguing against, he's arguing for, i.e. on page eight, where he says, you know, English is a great conduit to carry African thoughts. That's not really what he's saying. But if you're not connecting these thoughts together, you'll miss that, right? It's a counter argument to prove his point. Actually, it's a counter argument to pose the question. How do we get so feeble-minded? But he left breadcrumbs back on page six to let us know, well, this is how that played out. Other thoughts, questions, comments on the reading? Can I add something? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say, I really, I don't know, I liked how openly they expressed their distaste in like Western culture and imperialism. Because even Somme, I think that reading, he was open, like, you know, he didn't hide how the Western culture or how, like, you know, um, disrespectful they were and how destructive, like, they just destroyed everything in their past, technically what he was saying. And then this, um, in Gugi, he's saying that um, imperialism, which is, you know, uh, con 
consequence of um, the um, <clears throat> colonization, how like it, the, you know, he didn't like, you know, it was so bad. He didn't even want to speak English. Like he didn't want to write in English. Like they, I don't know. I just like how they don't hide how, um, how much they don't like the Western culture and colonization and stuff. So and I'm like, a, I don't know, they have a point. So. Now they have a good point. So to, to, to give you a little bit further information, um, I mentioned Amy Césaire earlier. This is a book from Amy Césaire. It's called Discourse on Colonialism. Uh, I'm going to just read you how he opens up his discourse. Now, think about a discourse is a written argument, right? So you want to talk about talking some shit? Listen to this. <clears throat> a civilization that proves incapable of solving the problem it creates is a decadent civilization. A civilization that chooses to close its eyes to its most crucial problems is a stricken civilization. A civilization that uses its principles for trickery and deceit is a dying civilization. The fact that the West, sorry, the fact that the so-called European civilization, Western civilization, as it has been shaped by two centuries of bourgeoisie rule, is incapable of solving the two major problems to which ex its existence has given ri rise, the problem of the proletariat and the problem of the colonial. I'm going to just stop it there. But when you talk about being unafraid or unapologetic in your critique of a system that is decadent, Césaire lays it out right there. And it's really in that opening stanza, right? A civilization that proves it capable of solving its own problems is a decadent civilization. Civilization that chooses to close its eyes to its most crucial problems is a stricken civilization. A civilization that uses principles for trickery and deceit is a dying civilization, right? So this is a charge that Césaire is making to Western civilization. Now, Alyssa brings up a good point in the sense of how bold they are. This is, this is a question of method, right? They're taking a stance to say, like, nah, we're not dealing with this colonialism, we're not dealing with this imperialism, like, nah, we're, we're anti this, right? And they're writing as such. So as writers and as thinkers and as intellectuals yourself, Think about what you're against. Think about, are you an anti-racist scholar, right? So if you do consider yourself an anti-racist scholar, how are you gonna write about racism, right? Are you gonna uh, give it a pass? Are you gonna try to justify it? Are you gonna call it like it is, right? This is a method on thinkers, and this is why I chose these particular scholars, right? Because they're very unabashed in the way that they challenge systems of oppression, right? And to me, this is how we must be as scholars if we want the status quo to change. Um, personally, it's just, me, it's just me, I'm not okay with the status quo. I don't feel that the society and the civilization that we're currently in is a good place for my children, right? So my job and the way that I see my role as a scholar is to do what I can to change that, right? And so when I write, I write to change that. When I teach, I teach to change that. When I produce whatever, it's in the spirit of changing this circumstance, these circumstances, right? So again, being cognizant of your audience and being cognizant of your voice is important as writers or whatever you consider yourself to be. Because once you know that, then you can say, look, I'm, a, I'm, I'm taking heads. I don't care about who feels some kind of way about this. I don't care about who's being offended. My voice is necessary and is needed, and I have something to say, and I'm going to say it unapologetically, right? And so Alyssa is kind of talking, to, is kind of tipping on a methodological approach I have myself as your professor, right? I'm giving you these books for a reason, right? I'm having you engage this information for a reason, right? Um, they may, the United States will not consider itself a colony, or a, but it moves in a very colonial fashion, right? You could call it a very much a settler colony, colony, right? So as you're reading these people engage colonialism and you're reading these people engage imperialism, it's really no different than your current circumstances. It really isn't. I mean, if we think about what we just read from Césaire, has America overcome the problems that it created? Is America still dealing with racism? Fuck yeah. Is, is racism something that is created within this country? Yes, right? 
Um, is America turning a blind eye to its problems? Fuck yeah. That's why we continue to have the same problems we're having, right? So even though these things are written in 1960, 1980, they have relevance in our time today. Think about the third paragraph of our journal. How does what you read apply to what's going on today, right? That's why I'm trying to get you to think about that. It ties, it all fits, right? And what happens is, if anything, the powers that be, they evolve their system of oppression. They don't go away, they just evolve and look different, right? Um, one more comment and we'll call it a day. Somebody else, Presley, you haven't said anything today. What are your thoughts on the readings? What are your thoughts on Ngugi? Did you like it? You think he was tripping? Didn't agree with his premise? Can I say something? Please. Okay. So, um, so when we were talking about, let me just switch to my reading really quick. Um, how he wanted to like develop and make like a new language. Like I would, I didn't really take it as how we discussed it in class. I kind of took it as like how, like you know how like trends like go on where like we make like kind of us like Gen Z or stuff, like we make a new word like every month. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I took it. Like words are always developing or like we're making new words and that's how like our language kind of like develops. So that's kind of how like I took it in a sense. And, and, and to be honest with you, Jen, I think he's talking about it in the same context, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think in what he's saying is like, Let's not let's not paraphrase. Let's just read what he says. I think was that page six that he talks about that. Mm, check. Um, no, actually, it's page nine. Yeah. Page nine. So yeah, I was, yeah, read, page eight, um, nine. The second paragraph. So some may regard this way of writing English as a uh, desecration of the language. This is of course not true. Living languages grow like living things, and English is far from a dead language. There are American, West Indian, Australian, Canadian, and New Zealand versions of English. All of them add life and vigor to the language while reflecting their own respective cultures. Why shouldn't there be a Nigerian or West African English which we could use to express our own ideas, thinking and philosophy in our own way? So I think he would agree with you. Um, Jim, and, and I don't, I don't know if you guys listen. So, like this music I was playing before class started is a, a artist named Burna Boy, and he's from Nigeria, and he speaks um, Naja is the language that he speaks. But the way that the music sounds is a combination of English and Naja, right? And it almost sounds like a completely different language when listening to it, and you often can't tell when he's blending the English or the Naja, and sometimes words or like the first part of the word will be Naja and the second part of the word will be English. So it actually literally merges the two words together, right? So I think that could be an example of that new creation of language. Um, Ebonics um, is an example of that new creation, creation of language, right? Um, and, and I think because of, let's just call it what it is, especially in the contemporary, in the modern sense, pop culture is essentially black culture that has shifted to where it's no longer on the margins. It's become infused in the core of American, of American culture, right? Um, I, I remember I was in Apple, I was working at Apple, and we had like a training and they had to name our group. And I, one of the little, you know, white girl, blonde hair, whole just typical Western white, like Midwest white girl, you know? And the, what she chose for the group was like some hip hop colloquialism. And it kind of blew me away, but I was attentive to the fact like, man, this is how far that our language has come, right? So this random white chick from Texas is using hip hop to define our group, right? So you just see how, so, and then if you, if you take that <laughs> into consideration, maybe Achibe has a little bit more length to his argument than we're giving him credit, right? So maybe there is a little bit more that could be done with English than what we thought. And I think when we get into the reading next week, uh, this idea of Creo, we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so when you think about Creo, think about Creo food and how that's put together. Um, when you think about Creo, think about music like jazz and how 
the act of jazz music is played, right? So this idea of improvisation, right? So Train will play a, a note and then Miles will respond to what Train played. Think about this as it plays out in this notion of Creo. Um, think about <clears throat> borders being crossed as you think about the next week's reading. Um, think about um, colonialism and the slave trade, right? How you're taking people across borders and mixing people who speak various languages, right? So think about these things as you get into next week's reading. Um, heads up, Edward Glissant is a poet. He's a Francophone poet. So the reading is abstract as fuck. It's not very clear. It's not very like, oh, this is what I'm saying. This is my argument, boom, boom. He's a poet, right? So he's gonna play with the English language a little bit. He's gonna play with ideas. So oftentimes he's gonna bring up something just to get your mind thinking about it, right? So just read it slow. It's not a lot of pages I gave you because of this. Um, read it slow and take your time with it, but trust what you're reading, right? So if you have a visceral response, if you feel it in your gut somewhere, it's meant for that, right? So trust whatever that response is. Um, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask me. I'll be happy to help you, um, you know, make a little bit more sense of the reading. But that's what will be the task of when we meet next week. Is there any questions, comments, concerns, or anything before we close out today? All right. Um, bear with me on this one. I say it's a little bit, it's a little bit um, abstract. And then um, after this coming week, we're gonna get into a little bit more contemporary American thinkers, um, some Baldwin, um, some Toni Morrison, things like that, a little bit more straightforward, but it's still this notion of developing our voice. Um, I'll hang out if you guys do have any personal questions.